city of Sierra Madre to address the chamber on the state of the city. Um, I am going to try um, to introduce some of our distinguished guests here, and I will apologize in advance if I forget anybody. We have a representative from Senator Marquette's office, Norma, right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman's office, Steve Johnson, give Steve a hand. Uh, I'd also like to recognize two of our former mayors who are with us this morning, and I should say beloved former mayors, because they are beloved former mayors. First, George Maurer, who's in the back. And Ina Joppe, who's right here. Councilmember John Buchanan, and our city manager Elaine Aguilar. So, as I said before, I know I'm forgetting somebody, but um, I will. We have one more representative, and that is. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. going through a PowerPoint slide presentation. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Okay. I just have to pretend again like I'm speaking to my children and they're three feet in front of me. So I'll speak really, really, really loud. Um, I don't actually have the remote control, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to nod my head. I want you to know that's not a nervous condition, it's not a tick, it's not Tourette's syndrome, it's just a signal to the city manager to change slides. So we will... Begin by. <laughs> there you go. First slide is the state of the city. I'm going to focus first on recent challenges, and that's just a euphemism for the fire in my slides. Uh, then I'm going to turn to the city budget perspective, status of current upcoming projects and programs. I'm going to make some personal observations, and I'm not going to tell you what they are right now. And finally, I'll reserve some time for questions um, and actually making the rounds and, and meeting all of you. The uh, first slide is a picture of that horrific Santa Anita fire. The second slide is the response. Um, it was an overwhelming response from throughout the state of California. We had more than 35 fire agencies that came to our assistance. Some were our neighbors. Um, and some came from as far away as Redwood City. Uh, in addition to the response from the fire agencies, we had a tremendous response from the 14 law enforcement agencies. I should tell you, in the first slide, I referred to police departments, and then I was told that because of participation from the sheriff's department, I could not refer to the police department. So I referred to the law enforcement agencies. Question that I'm continually asked is, what is the fire going to cost the city? Well, the final costs are being calculated with the total response estimated at more than $4 million. <clears throat> big, big numbers. And the city's portion will amount to uh, approximately $300,000 to $2 million. Now, why that dramatic range? <clears throat> We're hoping that we will be able to recover the lion's share of the costs that have been or will be allocated to the city through grants. But in the event that that does not happen, the number could be as high as $2 million. Of course, following the fires came the mud. And I'm just hopeful that this is the last biblical type plague that's <laughs> going to have to deal with. Uh, I included the figure at the bottom, an estimated 1,800 cubic yards, to give you some idea of the magnitude of this mini slide. Uh, I have been told that a good sized dump truck holds only 10 cubic yards. So that's 180 dump truck trips. Now how are we preparing for this winter storms in the mud? The staff's completed an assessment all of all the potential mud flow areas. This is an example of drainage area 40. Got another drainage area 3C also known as one part, and drainage area three of the Mount Wilson Trail. And staff has completed an analysis that examines the current capacities of the various debris basins compared to potential maximum flows. 
So those are three very, very important figures. The first is the total debris which can be captured by existing debris basins. That's 237,900 cubic yards. So again, if you divide that by 10, you come up with the total number of dump truck trips that would require to remove the mud. The next figure is the total debris that cannot be captured by the debris basins, 57,150 cubic yards. Now, that is the debris that would essentially, in a major, major storm or storms, would escape in between the areas covered by the debris basins. It's not the overflow from the debris basins. And a lot of people have asked, well, why don't we just construct debris basins that would protect the entire city of Sierra Madre? There's a number of reasons why we can't do that. The first is cost. I mean, we're not in a position to build sort of a mini Great Wall of China. The second reason is, um, and unfortunately, I, I know this very well, um, the permitting and especially the environmental review that would be required, who knows how long that would take, and it would certainly take a long Add those two figures together, you come up with 292,550 cubic yards. What does that mean? It means we need to What are the costs associated with abating the mud from the last slides, and what are those costs going to be? The estimated cost to address future mud flows, big numbers again. 500,000, which is the low end, and we can be fairly confident we're going to spend about that amount of money in the next few months and over the course of the year, up to 2 million. Why again that colossal range between 500,000 and 2 million? 2 million is the worst case scenario. 2 million is El Nino times 10 over a three day period of time. We have all the money coming down from the mountain flow. We are fortunate in that we've had um, a tremendous amount of support from the county, and we will continue to be receiving a tremendous amount of support from the county in terms of rainy season preparation. We've had county engineers actually visiting people in the canyon areas, um, providing them with very specific information, so specific they actually draw little diagrams, um, describing, explaining, um, encouraging people to take steps right now to uh, minimize the negative impacts of the <coughs> And here's a, another uh, diagram showing what you should be doing, although that obviously involves a lot more preparation. Uh, many more recommendations for the protection of the homes are included in the county's homeowner's guide for flood, debris, and erosion control. We've got copies here today, so I would encourage you uh, to take a copy, make copies for your friends. They're in the back, actually, there. They're also available online at that address, and um, we want to be as user-friendly as possible. If anyone in the community has questions regarding the mudslide issues and how to take steps to prepare yourself for the mudslides, you call our public works. So, and again, since we live in Sierra Madre, the number is just 7135. I'm sorry for all those people who have an 836 number like my <laughs> So, what are the lessons that we need to learn right now? Don't wait, prepare now, keep supplies ready and available, and assist your neighbor because your neighbor's going to be assisting you as well, especially if you live in a canyon area that might be. Uh, the next area that I want to focus on is our budget. Even though the residents, and thank you residents, past measure you last April, the city's finances are still very tight. Um, fortunately, measure you will fund um, pay increases for our police department and approximately $200,000 for our paramedic services. Uh, we also have other non-restricted general fund revenues. Um, Unfortunately, they're estimated to remain pretty flat and some may even decrease. Um, and these are the revenues that fund our big ticket items, such as the library, the police, fire, senior, and general administrations. And as all of us know, our revenues are not keeping up with our operational costs. And there's a number of reasons for that. Inflation is one. Increase um, prices for commodities and especially fuel have gone up dramatically in the last really 18 months. So even with the passage of Measure U, we're going to need to reduce expenditures in 08 and 09, and that will probably require reducing city services. Uh, this is a, a chart showing our revenues. 
uh, for 07 and 08. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Did I nod my head? That was, no, it was an accident. I think I did this. That was the, the old neck break instead. You'll see for 07 and 08, um, our revenues are a little over 18 million. Uh, those are in thousands. And for 08, 09, um, the numbers come down. It's actually just a little over 17. Unfortunately, our expenditures are much higher. 21,953,000 for 07, 08, and then for 08, 09, 19,353,000. So how do we make up the difference? Well, based upon our current estimates, we're going to have to dip into uh, our reserves. That's one way we can do that. And that will require additional expenditures of $100,000 to $300,000 for this year. And then another $100,000 to $300,000 in reserves um, you know, for the next fiscal year. And what I want to emphasize is those estimates do not, I'll say that again, they do not include the potential general fund um, expenditures for the firefighting and the mudslide abatement and prevention costs. And as you saw before, those numbers um, can be you know, absolutely enormous. In addition to the general fund expenditures, we've got a number of major projects, but these are major projects that will be funded out of other budgets, the non-general fund. And so I've, I've listed um, a number of them, and the asterisk just refers to the fact that these aren't general fund monies that are being applied. We've got a number of things going on, or have been going on. We've got library landscaping, senior center renovation, a senior moderate room, a CNG fueling station, uh, emergency operations center construction, and we're going to have to spend a lot of money to comply with the very onerous um, general plan and housing element. Here's some of the other uh, projects. Really, really big ticket items. Uh, reservoir replacement, energy retrofits, um, purchase of uh, new playground equipment, Sierra Vista Park, and street improvements. Uh, here is a small list of uh, city council accomplishments. And I have to say that um, many of these accomplishments um, can be and should be attributed uh, not only to the current city council, but the previous city council as well. We have um, at the top of the list the passage of measure U, which is the public safety initiative that we passed. Um, we've got a new paramedic program, um, which is being funded in, in part from the measure U public safety monies. We've seen a dramatic reduction in crime in the city, it's gone down 20% over the past two years. And um, I don't see our police chief here this morning, but uh, we need to give her and her senior staff, see Rubens here this morning, a lot of credit for that um, really, really dramatic reduction. So why don't we give her and her senior staff a credit. Give her an applause and extension. Maybe her ears are, you know, are burning right now. Uh, we also have a new firefighter auxiliary program, and the idea there was by increasing staffing to the, improve the response time. My personal observations, they're so personal, <laughs> I didn't write any of them down. My first uh, personal observation should come as, as no surprise is given the two natural disasters that confronted our poor city uh, and the other cost of doing business as a city, we're going to have to make some very hard choices this year. And I know previous city councils have talked about having to make those hard choices. And through good governance and, and, and hard work, um, we've been able to put them off. But we're not going to be able to do that this year. Um, what are those hard choices? Well, I talked about some of them. Um, the largest being the reduction of some sort of, of city services. That having been said, um, I'm confident that with input from the community, and I'm hoping a lot of input from the Chamber of Commerce, we'll be able to make those choices in the least painful manner. And we're fortunate in that we have some very senior, senior staff and some new fresh blood, um, new department heads to help us with making those hard choices. 
Another personal observation that I wanted to make is I'm going to make it uh, my personal priority, and I'm sure I'll be joined by members of the council, to make zero monitoring more business friendly. I know in the past people have talked about making the city more business friendly, but I think we need to actually start doing that now. So what I'm going to propose in the near future is an ad hoc committee that will be comprised primarily of members of the Chamber of Council. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, excuse me, to advise the City Council in ways that can actually be accomplished. So those are my two big personal observations. So we'll go to the last slide, which is questions. So I'm safe. I really did get through that. If anybody have any questions, feel free to ask me now in this context, or I'm, I'm going to sit down and walk around in a few minutes. Um, if you don't want the, everybody else in this room to hear what the question is, so. <laughs> You, you can, you can uh, ask me in a more private setting. And also, um, feel free um, to meet with me on my office hours, which are Saturday at Beantown, or give me a call at home. Uh, my number is 355-4395. So I'm, I'm also on the phone book. So thank you again for having me uh, this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. Any questions? Hi. What's happening with one Carter? <laughs> question everybody wants to know. I, I would like to know. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to know as well. Um, geophysically, we saw the pictures of. Can actually, can you go back to that slide? Of what one Carter looks like. <clears throat> after the fire. Um, you know, it probably looked only marginally better before the fire. <laughs> um, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Bruce talk real briefly about the potential impact of mudslides before I go into a, what I think was the meat of your question, which is where are we moving in the, in the future? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of mudslides, uh, you're absolutely correct. There was no mud that came off of this site uh, during that last storm. Uh, LA County Public Works, which was involved in the review of the plan and the design of the drainage systems, has also been up there and looked at it. They are, uh, LA County is also comfortable that there shouldn't be any mud coming off this, this particular site. And we're encouraging the developer to get back up there to continue work and to, at very least get the drainage system and the debris basins that are on that site. But for now, it's, it's looking okay, and we're expecting that work to be done before the rainy season. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate that. Uh, there was also um, a rumor that one part of it was going to be sold. Um, and it was a rumor. Uh, ultimately, what we all learned, um, and there's always been a veil of secrecy uh, when it concerns this particular developers, was that some of the parties, and these are typically limited liability companies or members of limited liability companies, wanted to be able to sell their shares um, in the entity that would ultimately develop the property, and they were unsuccessful in, in doing that. Um, it, it turns out the um, limited liability company or limited liability companies, plural, that had a controlling interest in the proposed development was actually uh, able to stop the sale of the smaller interest in the property. So, um, as I said, that was a rumor that the development company itself or the entire property uh, was going to be sold to some other entity. Um, so, uh, currently the, the ownership structure um, has not changed and uh, over time, we are hopeful that they, you know, as Bruce said, that they will continue with the work, um, take steps to ensure that the uh, mud does not move off of the hillsides. And uh, and I say, come to their senses with respect to um, resolving issues that we have to see. Can the city have any kind of input on that? I think there is such a goal hard on them. Are they actually do take action? We, we, um, a few years ago, entered into a very comprehensive settlement agreement um, with the developer. You know, I say comprehensive, it, it spelled out just about every eventuality you could possibly think of. And so that gives us um, legal leverage 
uh, in terms of forcing them to do things that um, they've agreed to do or should be doing on a, on a going forward basis. Um, but obviously, um, there are many residents, um, including myself, um, uh, as well as I, I think I'm speaking for the, the council as a, as a whole, and, and John's here and tell me to be quiet if I'm, if I'm not. Um, we're not satisfied with what, you know, what they have been doing. Um, and we will be. Um, it's one of the things that the council will be focusing on is getting them to, you know, pardon my French, to get off their death. What is the status of the uh, college market and the skilled nursing? Um, I will start with Howie's and then I'll proceed to the, the skilled nursing center and I will ask the city manager to, to, to jump in. Where things stand right now with the Howie's Market um, project is it's, it's in limbo, essentially. Um, we do not have new plans for the development yet from the developer, although, I mean, um, he has actually a, another LLC, but the representative of the LLC has indicated that such plans will be forthcoming. Um, because of delays by the developer, not by the city or, or the city staff, um, that project will be subject to the 2013 initiative, um, which means uh, we will not be seeing 55 condominiums on that that is its point in our city. So that, that was the first part of your question. The second part of your question had to do with the skilled nursing home. Um, that developer has also been particularly um, quiet. Um, I think I said 55 units of that was actually going to be 72 um, on, the, on the corner at Howe's. It's 55 that are proposed for the skilled nursing center across the street from uh, our, our city hall. And um, I'm quite sure that developer will take the position that it is not subject um, to the 23013 initiative and therefore should be entitled to the construction of the um, proposed 55 um, condominiums. Uh, last I checked, um, the plan was to provide some retail or commercial space on the bottom floor of that part of the development that was fronting the street. But um, I guess the best way to describe it is that was really the proverbial tail wagging the dog. Really, really small storefronts. And um, I haven't seen any plans or heard any rumors as to what would actually go into those teeny tiny little storefronts that, that um, front, front the street. So that's where we are with those um, two developers waiting for them essentially to come back to the city and say, okay, we're ready to go. So in both case scenario, you're talking about 2013. So meanwhile, the city are looking at things that board it up and uh, you know, people coming on the main street of the city and the city of the city. Yeah, um, no surprise, here's my personal opinion. Um, I don't think you can blame 23013 for that property being boarded up. Um, you're referring specifically to the skilled, nurse, skilled nursing home. And here's why I say that. Even if there was no 23013 initiative, that site has two different zones, actually, zones for two different properties. So the developer would have to resolve the fact that it's residential in the back and not residential in the front. It also has um, enormous setbacks that have to overcome in order for their plan to move forward as it's currently um, envision they have to overcome the setback issues. They need a conditional use permit, and right now, for those of you who are in the you know the, the real estate business, it's it's not a real good time to be selling condominiums. So I mean, again, this is my my personal opinion. I think even without two thirty thirteen, um, they'd probably be in some kind of holding pattern right now until they figured out whether or not it made economic sense for them to move forward with the, with the development. I mean, we know we've got some beautiful townhouses, for example, um, that people are trying to sell on Sierra Monterey Boulevard and some others, you know, off of, off of Baldwin um, that are not impacted by 23013. But what they're impacted by, obviously, is um, a real estate market where prices are declining. And obviously, um, the developers who built them are inter interested in maximizing <coughs> the returns. So. Mayor Mayor, hi. Mr. Mayor, 
I think it's an interesting fact that our city fire department in its 85 year history has never lost a house to a brush fire. There's very few departments in this area that can make that claim. However, we've almost lost a, a woman in mud, so mud is, you know, is more dangerous than a fire in this community. Uh, so we really have to take the mud flow really serious. I, I, I agree with all the comments that, that the mayor made. Um, I, I think we all need to be very, very thankful that we didn't lose um, any lives uh, or homes to the fire. And the worst property loss was um, what's been described as a tool shed. I'm not sure actually what was stored in that in that in that, in that shed, but um, that was yeah that was the that was the extent of our um, of the loss of, of, of the property. Uh, but I also agree with the second part of his comments, which is um, ironically now the, the big threat and on a going forward basis, um, it looks like it will be the, the biggest threat is the potential impact from mudslides. I'd like to offer a comment along those lines, um, and, and maybe it's something for us all to consider, and, and certainly the, the mayor's comments right on target in terms of the need for quick information in the disaster. And uh, previously, the Canyon Fire about 10 years ago, and one of the problems with that incident was that uh, there's almost no communication at all in the early And we did a fire, and residents evacuated, saw the back of it. Seems to me like this is a real challenge in our community that uh, that for future events, uh, you know, in the day of days of cable, we all have now other types of communications, text communications, uh, the city's appeared at that we need to really look at how we get information out to the residents quickly and accurately to, uh, to, to both contain the concern and also get, uh, get Yeah, it's, it's valid criticism. Um, I mean, we were doing, it sounds very political, and I don't mean it, we are doing the best job we could under the, the circumstances, and one of the things that we learned in terms of disseminating the information is it takes a lot of people. When I say a lot of people, not just one person or, or, or two people, but you need one person actually operating the computer, you need somebody else disseminating that information, and then these individuals can't work 24 hours a day. You need three, four, five, six people. Um, it was, a, it was a, a problem or a potential failing that was highlighted very early on. Um, in the process, we're still hearing about it. You know, hearing about it today, and um, we did, you know, both informal and formal debriefings after the fire. And it was one of the things that we targeted for improvement. Actually, uh, Elaine, you want to uh, talk a little bit about um, how things will be different in the future? Um, hopefully, you noticed the for the muds. We did much better on the SMTV3. It was an experiment, and probably was not the fires. Was probably not the best time to do an experiment. Someone had the idea, let's use SMTV3 to get the information out. And we hadn't planned enough in advance on how to physically make that happen. Um, there wasn't a way to do it remotely. Our EOCs in a different building than the equipment for the SMTV3. We were very short staffed. It meant somebody leaving the EOC to come to City Hall to, to do the updates. And there were times when we just couldn't spare that staff person. Well, because we briefed on that when the mud flow happened, we had a backup system. So hopefully you notice for the mud flow, it was much more um, updated information. And we did small things like including the time of the last update. So if you tuned in, you'll know if the information hadn't changed, but you saw it was recently updated because that was still the current information. Um, the briefing after the mud, we realized, you know, if your electricity is down, you're not going to have SMTV3. So we actually have a plan going back to the city council in the very near future to, to exactly do what the gentleman um, uh, mentioned. We need to get the information out in different formats. SMTV3 is one. We've already set up on the city's internet website, which hopefully if you have you know, a laptop and a wireless internet connection, we're going to have it in the next emergency. You'll actually be able to go to a blog because we can sit in the EOC and update the city's website <coughs> and do a blog. It's going to be a one-way blog. We're only going to get the information out. We won't be able to ask questions because that would just overwhelm us. But we're going to have a blog next time, so that will be another thing. We're also looking at, you've heard of the reverse 911 systems. 
Um, we're looking at what it would take to implement that. Um, we're also looking at another service. Um, you may have heard where messages can go out. You give us your cell phone number, you take text messages, we'll be able to do a mass text message to everyone who wants to give us their cell phone number to do that. So we're looking at a variety of different means of communication. So hopefully we'll be able to communicate much better and much quickly with everyone given all the scenarios, you know, power going out, telephone kinds going out, all the things that could happen. And that report will be going to the city council very near the future. And I, and I don't, Bill Coburn's still here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there he is. Fact. Um, Bill did a, a great job actually of updating the community on the development um, during both the firefighting activities as well as the mudslide uh, prevention and abatement, and I have to say his, his um, coverage was considerably uh, better than his competitors, including the, the, the Snardens. But, um, you know, uh, Bill, I hope you're going to be around Thank for a long you. time. But <laughs> Bill, <laughs> if, if, you know, Bill is on vacation you know, during that weekend <laughs> when the next biblical plague strikes, um, you know, it, it, pre it presents a challenge, so, um, and that's that's a challenge, you know, as Elaine was just saying, you know, we're trying to address it. Um, just a, a note from, when, when this was going on, I remember seeing it at midnight or something, we were out there on the street, but, um, you know, we've got, in the 59th district, the Sony Banana represents, we have, we have the mountains all here, we're all foothills, we go all the way to Arrowhead, and we've had a lot of fires in that district. And um, if any fires in this area, if any homes were lost in the last few fires, they've always been in the 59th district, Fairmont, up in Arrowhead, some of those places. But in all that time, and I came, I came by first and saw the smoke, and then I reported that back to the sun, and then a little later, I never have seen as many as mass a group of firefighters as quick a time as that. In all the time I've been around, it was the fastest response. And a mass in your fire department should give all, all the credit because they were, I believe, ran in the command until Sunday at 6 o'clock, which is when things were all pretty much under control. And your fire department did that. So they should be commended totally because it was, you know, I could send, I, I send emails to the assemblyman to tell them that stuff. And we were just, we were relieved because of that. Because, you know, we've seen fires that start that take off and they, they, lose, they lose control of them and then you're in big trouble. But this was a, a real, to be commended and a real good effort in, in keeping that fire down. So, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, one of the things that I did during the fire was um, contact our elected representatives up to thank them for the support that we had been receiving in terms of the fire suppression, but also to ensure that we continue to receive the support. And the support from the state level was overwhelming. Um, and that takes nothing away from our own volunteer firefighters, but the aerial tankers that were dropping the fire suppression uh, powder, I mean, anybody who was here was probably just, you know, um, overwhelmed by how dramatic that was. I mean, yet you, you had those pilots flying those tankers essentially blind. Uh, because if they were actually looking at the topography, they'd fly away or crash into the mountain. I mean, they were essentially following the water planks. And that's state support. That doesn't come from the city of Los Angeles or the county. That, that comes from the state level. Um, we also have um, OES support. One of our trucks is, a, is an OES truck. That's also state support. And um, in the command center over at, at the park, um, we had you know, senior level people help managing the fire suppression efforts from the state. So um, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You know, we can't, we can't thank, we can't thank you enough. So. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that there is a ham radio group in town that has been functioning for over eight years now. We practice at four of the events every year, just so that we're in communication. And this will be our first two of our emergency evacuations. And our police department has suddenly realized the value of ham radio communication. So for example, there's supposed to be at least 90 hams who live here in Sierra Madre. 
have is we're looking to make communication with as many of them as we can because our uh, police department would like to know who would be willing to be part of the communications network in the event of large emergencies. Because if the power goes down and if the cell towers go down, you know, even wireless may not work and cell phones may not work. So there is a backup process that we're kind of feeling our way towards. And if you know anybody who's a ham radio operator, uh, please ask them to go to Bill's website and hunt us up and connect with us. Our next meeting is going to be next Tuesday evening at the only place in town. The formal meeting is at 7.15. Um, I'm just talking about the general plan where you are. We are actually just getting started in terms of um, amending our, our general plan to comply with the, primarily with the housing element in the short term. And that's going to be a challenge because um, we have Sacramento telling us essentially that we need to provide for you know, over 100 new dwelling units in the city of Santa Monica, which is a challenge because we're able to help the city. You know, and last time I checked, we didn't have um, giant plots of undeveloped land where we could build um, high-rise condominium complexes. So we're just beginning that, that process right now, and we're focusing on ways, obviously, to comply with the laws, um, but I would hope not necessarily build, you know, all 138 uh, dwelling units unless, you know, it's determined to be absolutely necessary, um, and in any event, with you know, what our vision is of Sierra Madre as a small town. Other questions, concerns? Anybody want to make a point about something? Kurt, we may want to mention, follow on the last question, that uh, we are, at this point, at least intending to form a general plan steering committee at the end of the forum, probably over a decade. And we will accept applications to be on that committee. We should be cautioned that we actually haven't defined the scope or the length of time that that committee will be in place. So if you are, feel that your schedule will be fairly unimpeded, you know, for a year or so or more, maybe the feel free right away. But we will be fleshing that out a little bit more in July to actually let, to define more closely the the goals of the committee and and about how long we think it will be, but we are accepting applications for that committee now. You can see the payment and the general fund for that committee. Well, that's because it's going to be comprised of volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, and you know, it's, it's been a very positive experience at Sierra Madre is that some of the best ideas actually come out of these um, citizens' committees. And I mean, that's no surprise because they're comprised of uh, residents who often have expertise in that particular area or areas um, and who have the time. I mean, obviously they're volunteering to devote you know, their efforts towards whatever the goal or goals of the committee are. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of um, the UT committee, but um, I, I would hope and I'm, I'm confident actually that um, some of those same uh, bright um, and productive ideas come out of the committee of John's company as well. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Oh, thank Appreciate you. It.